Okay, uh, so um, following on from uh, Craig's paper, um, uh, I'm going to carry on the conversation about uh, about um, uh, uh, new materialists and post-human feminism in contemporary practice. Uh, and I want to think uh, about the, 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 the role that, that, that post-human feminism plays in this. I, I called this paper Becoming Archaeologist because uh, like everyone else in this paper, my, uh, in this paper, in this session, mm -hmm. uh, my work is profoundly influenced by uh, Deleuze and Guattari and by those who've been influenced by Deleuze and Guattari. Um, and as I've argued elsewhere, uh, and in previous versions of this paper, the notion of becoming and of viewing teaching and learning uh, and being archaeologists as part of messy relational assemblages that are unfixed and unfinished is, I think, a really valuable way for us to shift from masculist, androcentric, heteronormative, structurally racist and colonialised views of what it is to be an archaeologist. However, that, uh, I'll come back to all of that because that's a big <laughs> mouthful, so I'll come back and talk about that a little bit more in the paper. Um, but uh, at the heart of my uh, argument is post-human feminism. And so I think perhaps I should have called this paper Becoming Post-Human Feminist Archaeologist. And in fact, oh, I brought it with me. Hang on a second. I've just finished reading. Well, I've been sort of dipping in and out of Rosie Gray Dotty's most recent book. Uh, and, uh, and, and I love it. And it's filled me with loads of joy and giddiness. And it's infused almost every part of this paper. And so I wonder if I should just like, sack off the title and just have a big picture of her book. <laughs> instead. Uh, uh, and I'll, I'll put it there and wave it around later on. So um, you might be wondering why this has filled me with giddiness particularly after Thursday's election, this is not a time of giddiness, this is a time of doom and rubbishness. Uh, and um, I'm going to talk about equality and diversity issues, and that is not a subject for giddiness for sure. Uh, things are bad, uh, and I think we probably all know, well, I, mean, I spend all my life just saying these statistics over and over again, and you probably also know our profession is profoundly lacking in uh, equality and diversity. Here's some, uh, just a few statistics which in summary say we are not equal or diverse. Uh, but uh, um, uh, things like 99.2% uh, of archaeologists are white, uh, only 1.8% of archaeologists are recording, uh, recorded as having a disability, but um, in, in private 13.5% uh, confidentially report to having mental health issues. Uh, that sexual harassment and assault is rife in parts of our profession. Um, what else haven't I covered? That, that women, uh, uh, that there is quite a lot of gender equality in terms of uh, young, younger women uh, in the workforce. But when we go, back, go behind those kind of statistics, there's real problems. And uh, the fact that only 33% of people have, uh, of women have reached MC for grades, so the highest sort of corporate level of expertise in, uh, um, uh, in CIFA suggest that there's some real, real problems going on. And these problems manifest themselves in th you know, three really publicly very shit things have happened this year. So um, earlier on this year there was the incident, uh, well, the whole of the SAA conference in which David Yesner, who'd been convicted, uh, who'd been found guilty of uh, harassing his students and, uh, and um, sacked, uh, came to the SAAs where his students who he had harassed were and wasn't asked to leave. Uh, so that was a real problem, as this person said. This What happened at the SAAs was merely a product of a discipline that's yet to purge itself of colonial and sexist power structures. And recently in the UK, we've seen this uh, reflected again. The Society of Antiquaries uh, failed to eject a uh, convicted uh, sex offender, sex abuser, uh, and almost at the same time, um, Danny Bradford, whose uh, uh, excellent research about sexual harassment was being awarded uh, while she was receiving her award, um, a group of people in the audience laughed at her to the point that the presenter had to tell them to stop. Uh, so really awful um, uh, discrimination uh, exists uh, within our profession. And here is a everything boiled down into one slide, which is terribly reductive, but basically things are terrible, aren't they? There is uh, a long-term embedded cross-sector problem with bullying and harassment uh, and with discrimination on the grounds of all the protected characteristics in the Equality Act, 
we have huge inequality, harassment and discrimination creates and perpetuates those both implicit and explicitly. We have a profound lack of diversity. We've clearly got barriers to entry and then progression within the, the profession, again, in all areas of protected characteristics under the Equality Act. And as a result, we've got ample examples of Me Too and Time's Up um, uh, occurring within our profession. So uh, in the face of this, you might wonder why I feel positive uh, and giddy reading uh, Rosie Bray Dotty, because this stuff is awful. Um, but uh, we all know from previous Ra Rosie Bray Dotty books, she takes the hand, uh, goes hand there. She addresses these straight on. And um, she argues that her book, this is a quote from her, highlights the positive potential of the post-human convergence and offers tools for coping with it affirmatively. Despair is not a project, she tells us. Affirmation is. So given all the negative stuff here, what I want to do in the rest of this paper is think about how we can move forward affirmatively. And um, the crucial thing to start off with by saying is that there's loads of good stuff going on already. I uh, feel very much that there is a groundswell of feminist and social justice activism happening in our profession in the UK right now. We've obviously got a sustained academic critique all the way from Conkey and Spectre right through to sort of great papers like Penny's paper that we saw in the first half of this uh, that's been, that was recently published. Uh, we've got um, a great work on um, uh, uh, guidance uh, on sexual harassment and codes of conduct. There's a series of really uh, amazing organisations that exist. The British Women Archaeologists, Trailblazers, Enabled Archaeology Foundation, Respect and Women's Mentoring in Heritage. And here's a plug for another session. They'll all be speaking together tomorrow uh, in the Women in Power session. We've got really vibrant social media activism. We've got good studies and statistics that support this. We've got people like e d officers in government agencies and policies initiatives by different commercial organisations, amazing third sector organisations who are always reaching out and working with others. And um, we're just on the uh, sort of cusp of forming an equalities collective for archaeology and heritage between some of these amazing organisations. We're hoping that we'll have a launch event on the 13th of March, but this is all sort of still a little bit up in the air, so watch this space and bother me if you would be interested in joining in with us. I chair the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists, the Quality and Diversity Group. We've been really busy. We only were founded 40, four, four years ago, uh, but we've done quite a lot. Um, lots of training, mental health first aid training, lots of conference sessions about diversifying the workplace, working with all of those other brilliant people. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of is that in 2018, we held a meeting where we drew together uh, big figures from across the profession um, uh, in all the different sectors, uh, CEOs of some of the big commercial units, people from national and local government, archaeology, from academia, third sector, all sorts of different people. And the outcome of that was uh, an industry group statement which came out in April 2019. It's really tiny text, but you know, it's on the CIFA website if you want to, uh, if you want to search for it. Uh, and I can also send you a link, but this statement makes a commitment to um, addressing, well, first of all, acknowledging and then addressing the um, uh, inequalities and uh, bullying and harassment and discrimination that exists within the profession and commits in the last sentence to publishing programmes of work, to taking some action on this. So, uh, so there's good stuff. but. If we turn back to uh, new materialism and post-human feminism, I suppose the question is, what's this? What can this bring to the party? And I think a really powerful argument from this field for feminism is that we need to free ourselves from the, the negative binary in which equivocity discussions are, are always banned. I'm just basically saying the same thing as Penny and Yvonne and Rachel and various and the, pretty much the rest of the session just in, in a, with a slightly different choice of Rosie Gray Dotty quotes. Um, but um, uh, yeah, um, so in fact, the first one is Dolphin and Van der Tuen. They say, equivocity is locked up in a dualist framework of thought, structured by negativity and linear time. Sexual difference implies that women and femininity should become equal to men in humanity, whereas university pushes difference to the limit 
producing a shift to an affirmative relationality. So put simply, when we discuss the need for equality in archaeology, it's always in terms of an opposition to the norm, to the major, and as a result it therefore both reifies that major and different from becomes structured as worth less than, just as in prehistory, the same is true in our contemporary practice. So the steps that we might take to diversify our profession always get caught in a tension which reproduces and gives primacy to the norms that we seek to disrupt and structures the non-normative as worth less than if we're, all we're looking for is equivocity. So instead, I find the new materialist argument persuasive uh, that rather than create more binaries, we must, as Braidotti says, go further and push towards qualitatively stronger deterritorializations towards becoming woman, becoming animal, becoming minor, becoming archaeologist. But what does this mean for feminist archaeological practice in real terms? How can we dismantle inequality and discrimination without the language of equivocity? Um, to answer this, I think it's really helpful to, to turn to the notion of the sandwich. I'll just put a very dotty down, which is getting sweaty in my fingers. Um, to, um, uh, to turn to the, the notion of assemblage in our contemporary practice <coughs> to expose and explore and follow the messy and complicated lines of flight of becoming archaeologist. There's, uh, I, I googled rhizome. Uh, and then I've used it in every paper I've ever, ever given. Um, so, by reconfiguring archaeologists in rhizomatic assemblage terms, we can push difference to the limit, as Rosie Braidotti says. And that means that we can critically account for the vibrant material assemblages in which archaeologists and archaeology become. Uh, so, the assemblage of the field site, uh, where uh, in amongst the, the stone and soil and finds, bodies bleed, where harassment takes place, the past is emergent, and so are archaeologists. And, and I think in one sense it's just, this sounds like pretty words, um, and it's quite abstract, but what I mean is that to dismantle discrimination and to diversify and to, to push difference to the limit, we need to start having an explicit conversation about the multiple material dimensions our assemblages, uh, of our assemblages, which are effective and which actualise the difference and the inexhaustible virtual possibilities of what it is to become archaeologist. But we need to do more than this. As Rosie Braidotti says, uh, the virtual only matters as far as it's actualised, which doesn't depend on willful individualism, but on community action. You can sense that your piece of card is coming up here in a second. Uh, because what I'd like us to do is take the Bray Dotty challenge. She, this isn't a Bray Dotty challenge, but it sounds fun, doesn't it? <laughs> let's take the Bray Dotty challenge. Um, so let's think about what we are actually going to do. What kind of collective, positive, affirmative, post-human feminist action can we do to dismantle discrimination and to push for difference in our profession? Just whilst uh, you have a think about the kind of things that you can do, because in a minute I'm going to ask you to write it down, let me skip through some suggestions. Uh, recently, CIFA have sent this to all registered organisations, and as of Monday, I think Doug said, um, uh, FAME will be sending it to all their members too. So commercial organisations will be getting this list, this 10-step list of suggested actions to diversify your workplace, including things like implementing a code of conduct or code of respect, calling out harassment and discrimination and having a, a reporting process for that. Um, only working with people who meet your standards, supporting uh, on equality and diversity, supporting family friendly working and so on. I'm going to skip through this but you can take a photo and find it uh, online as well. Karina Croucher and I have been thinking about this in terms of pedagogy and here we've been thinking about the, the role of human and non-human entities in the learning process and, and the kind of collaborative the amazing collaboration that comes out of that, very much like uh, Craig um, uh, argued, that's not what our book will look like, because look at this total station, it's too far off. <laughs> 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 so, uh, but that's, that's uh, uh, our book where we've expanded on this. <coughs> we've talked about all sorts of different things, about challenging neoliberalism by recentering training as part of wider learning assemblages, thinking about learning as multivocal and emerging through multiple material narratives and thinking about materially <coughs> ways to diversify our practice. And um, it's not just me that's been making recommendations in 2019. Rosie Pagotti's <coughs> got a whole chapter on it in her book called How to Do Post-Human Thinking. And her uh, suggestions are much bigger and I've condensed them very poorly into one slide. But 
Uh, things like making studies of feminist, queer, migrant, poor, decolonial, diasporic, disease, disabled humanities official, not just studies, but official. Using post-human qualitative criteria for evaluation and analysis in your work. Uh, breaking up established conventions and redefining the relationship between the humanities and science. That's very much distilling some, some much deeper uh, things. So here's the interactive bit, which will only take a second uh, because I am running past our, our timing. Um, so what I'd like you to do now on your piece of paper is write down what post-human feminist action you can take to diversify your workplace. You can't just sit in this warm room and relax. Mm. You need to write down what you're going to do. You've got two minutes to do it. And then I would like you to pass back your card. Here are some of the things that I said. You can just reproduce those if you, uh, if you don't want to think. Is my timer going to work? Yes, my timer is working. Uh, if everyone has passed their things back, then you can. What kind of things could you do in your, in your workplace, in your place of work to make a difference, to diversify your practice? Even if it's something, you know, small, like setting up networks to support people, uh, taking an E&D audit of your workplace, that's not small, decolonising your curriculum, using alternative means of assessment that shift the privilege uh, away from people who've been trained just to do essays and exams. Um, what kind of stuff can you do? Implement a code of conduct on your excavation. Check in on and give voices to people who uh, uh, push forward people who would normally be, lose voices within the, this process. Within academia, within commercial archaeology. It can be some small stuff, right, Hannah? Because uh, Hannah and I's supportive feminist relationship mostly revolves around sending each other feminist memes when we're sad at the world. Uh -huh. Send your friend feminist memes, memes when you're sad a legitimate at the world. contribution some days. And, uh, and, and Lizzo lyrics from, from <laughs> Lizzo Rachel. Lizzo lyrics, yes. <laughs> it's basically our relationship. <laughs> We should have done it like a countdown timer. Doo -doo, doo -doo. I think it does go boing at the end. Oh, yeah, I should warn people because if it does happen, it'd be like loud and surprising. Wake everyone up. Now I'll warn Dark Green. They turn the air conditioning off. It's sad. All right, when you've written it, pass your card forward. And then this is the point where Rachel will assist me and we'll just stick these up. If you don't want to share it, you don't have to. Don't share it. Does anyone on the front row would like to help us stick these up? That would be amazing. Sure. <laughs> I'm tethered. Oh, here we go. I'm tethering myself. Thank you. Yeah. There Oh, oh wait, yeah, yeah, I can read it. Oh. Some blue tack? Oh, yeah. You're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm going to have a look at it. No, not. <laughs> but that's it. That's my job. Yeah. 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 I think maybe we won't manage to do it. Thank goodness it's not Okay, whilst we're just sticking up a few, don't worry, we don't have to do this. Let's uh, 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 artificially uh, not do this. Not stick with it. Don't worry about that one. Is that pen? Oh, yes, it's a friendly whiteboard pen. Let's, uh, let's connect them all up. So here is uh, an assemblage of feminist action, be there, microactivism, questioning misogynistic, passive aggressive comments and jokes, uh, set up and encourage LGBTQ and disabled networks to support each other, report harassment to work uh, uh, and work to support those who have been harassed, uh, diversify reading this, teach students about social justice, Fight against the government of my country. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, talk to others about feminist texts to incorporate in other uh, other opinions and share ideas. 
uh, allowing some voices, I can't hear some voices uh, in archaeology to speak, changing teaching practice, advocate for inclusive practices in seminars, uh, not being afraid to call out poor practice and behaviours, uh, organise a women's circle. Anyway, there is some brilliant stuff here. It's a, I've mainly just drawn squiggles rather than they're not lines of flight, they're squiggles of flight. Um, so, the important thing, thank you so much Rachel, uh, is, oh, I've, lost my, I've lost my thing now. It's really easy to feel absolute despair, particularly after Thursday's election defeat, particularly after some of the shit stuff that is going on. But this kind of assemblage that we've created together is an affirmative assemblage of positive action that we can all take. And now I'm going to deterritorialize it. <laughs> and what I would like to do, all oh, apart throw it at myself, I'm going to pass this back. And the important thing is that I want you to get one of these that you didn't write and have something different that you didn't write. Oh, let's not leave them there. You also get an added extra piece of blue tack, and you wouldn't mind passing them <laughs> back. Whew. Oh yeah, thanks, Rachel. Uh, I feel sorry for whoever gets the one that says I should retire and get out of the way because if you're like 21, that's probably not the right message. <laughs> 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 so. This basically means that there are at least two actions that you can take. The one you wrote down, the one that you've received, and I noticed that some people have written more, so you've got some Brucey bonus ones if you've got one of those that's got extra ones on it. Uh, oh, wrong keyboard. So I hope that this affirmative paper has given you a sense of what you can do and actions that you can take. As Rosie Bray Dossie says, somewhere towards the conclusion of this book, you don't need to read it now, I've summarised it all for you. She says, affirmative ethics put the motion back into emotion and the active back into activism. Because of the abundance of unfulfilled possibilities, much remains to be done. But acknowledging that the virtual is inexhaustible uh, uh, is a source of inspiration that can be turned into a vector of active becoming. Yes, there is so much to do and it's exhausting just to think of it. But we need to start somewhere, however humbly. And I suggest that the humble is here in this room. So becoming post-human feminist archaeologist is about pushing for difference. It's about engaging in collective, affirmative, materially grounded practice to do so. It's about the way we can change things together. And like the card that you've got, it's in your hands. Thank you very much. <laughs>